Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Steinhardt. I'm the technology editor here at CBS Interactive, and we're proud to present. Sorry, we're proud to present. Ten ways to measure things. This is a live and interactive webcast sponsored by Looker, where we're talking about how to identify meaningful performance metrics and how to use analytics to get the most actionable insight from those metrics. To do that, we've got two experts from Looker with us today. Harthi Sadasivam and Marcel Babai. Harthi is the Senior Professional Services Analyst at Looker, and Marcel is a Senior Sales Engineer. And before I hand them the mic, I just want to remind everybody that today's presentation is interactive. So if you look to the left of your main viewing console, you'll see a Q&A box, and you can use that to submit questions at any point during the presentation. Uh, we're going to try to get to as many of them as we can during a Q&A session that's set aside for 10 minutes at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you'd like to download today's slides or you'd like to learn more about Looker and its approach to data analytics, look to the right of your viewing console and you'll find some helpful links under related resources. And if you'd like to read some blogs on the subject, you'll find those linked under the Q&A box. So everybody strap in and get ready. And with that, I'll turn things over to Harthi. Hi, everyone. This is Harthi. And this is Marcel. And uh, welcome to our webinar on how to measure things. So today we're going to talk about ways to measure things. Um, Marcel and I are both data analysts at Looker, and we use Looker as our BI platform to define these metric definitions. Uh, we can talk more about Looker um, in the QA session at the, the end of the, the webinar. And what we're going to be covering today is the 10 general ways that you can measure things that apply to most businesses, when to use each of these metrics, and how, um, and how to start applying this to your day to day. Yeah, so getting these metrics right is key. This is what's actually going to be used to make decisions by your business. Uh, increasingly, companies are trying to get an edge, every little edge that they can, by being data-driven. Um, so ensuring that you're making the right decisions with the correct information is key. We'll start off nice and simple with some very basic metrics. Most of that is going to likely be review for many of you here. We want to go through these for a couple of reasons. One, we want to make sure that we build a strong foundation so that when we get to the more complex metrics, you'll be standing on firm ground. Um, and two, we also want to go over common pitfalls that people run into even when measuring the most basic types of metrics. Hopefully, after today's session, uh, you'll come away with a few ideas for how to continually socialize these topics within your teams and have an open feedback loop for, uh, between the business users and, and the data teams uh, so that decisions are being made uh, the right way. So uh, sit back, relax, and let's talk metrics. Cool. So we actually wanted to kind of take a step back and provide a, an example um, data set that we'll be walking through. Uh, so we've picked a meal delivery surface, so think of something like Seamless or Grubhub. Uh, and some of the data points that might be relevant for this meal delivery service would be users. Um, you're going to have customers placing orders on this, this service. Those customers, um, those orders that those customers are placing are going to be serviced by drivers, uh, and they're going to be coming from restaurants. And on top of that, this uh, this uh, data set might also have a, a website or a mobile app that people are ordering through. So those are the, the data points that we're going to be dealing with to kind of walk through different metrics that you can start to derive. Awesome. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about here is measuring attempts. When you first start collecting data around this, it's usually best to collect as much as possible around attempts from the very beginning. Even if you don't think you're going to need them in the foreseeable future, um, it's much easier to get something and not need it than not have it um, and then try and get it later on. So you'll very likely want to go back and look at these someday for some potentially really big decisions. Um, keep in mind these are just ways, just a few ways to measure things, not necessarily every imaginable, imaginable way to do this. So things that we want to be checking are visits to a website, attempts made by customers to order food, um, orders that drivers receive to deliver that food, uh, attempts made by drivers to actually deliver that food, the number of attempts that, uh, or, or number of times customer feedback about that food delivery, um, clicks on a new button or feature, again talking about the web-related uh, data, um, and the number of times people try and place food in their cart. 
So again, that's a lot of different possibilities there, and, and like I said, there's a lot more to it. Uh, the one really important thing to keep in mind when dealing with these metrics and kind of the, the first pitfall here is dealing with noise. Um, these attempts might not necessarily give us the useful information we're looking for. We oftentimes need to filter out some noise, and we'll talk more about how that's going to work in the next few uh, slides. But really things about like, are we counting every website visit, every click on a new feature, um, every time somebody places an item in their cart, um, are we always trying to get every single one of those? So that's just something to keep in mind, especially as we go through these some more. We talked about measuring attempts. Um, it's important to look at those attempts in context and measure the success of each of those attempts. Uh, and so these successes are, for the most part, going to tie up to high-level KPIs that might be relevant for you or your business. Um, and so if we take this meal delivery services as an example, of all of the visitors that visited our site, we might be interested in the successful visitors that signed up for an account. We might be interested in customers that were able to successfully schedule a delivery compared to all the customers that tried to uh, schedule a delivery. And so these success criteria are going to be very important in terms of placing context around the, uh, the attempts that you have. Um, and kind of pitfalls here, be careful uh, about how you're filtering things out. Sometimes it's very easy to overcount the number of successes that you might have. So returned items or unsatisfactory orders that have been returned in our example, um, these would not be a part of the successes that we're measuring. Awesome. So the next thing that we want to talk about is conversion rates or any types of rates taking those successes and those attempts and combining those together. So it's really important not to just to look at each one of those on their own. Um, you know, for example, a thousand successful orders is great, but if there are a million attempts, uh, what happened to those other 999,000 orders that didn't go through? Um, and so that's just one example, of course, conversion rates can mean other things. Um, of all the drivers that received a delivery order, how many completed their delivery, of the orders, the customers that placed an item in their cart, how many submitted that order, um, of all the customers that were sent order feedback forms, how many of them filled out that form. Uh, so all, all these different types of things. And again, on that website side, visitors to website signing up for things. Um, so taking those percentages. Um, and this is really much, typically much more what we're concerned about is these, these conversion rates. That, that, that's going to give us much more insight into how well the organization is doing. Um, and we'll talk, talk a little bit more about, you know, what are, what are ultimately the things that we want to look at versus just some numbers on a, on a dashboard. Uh, again, here a big pitfall that we want to look out for is sample size. So while I did say that the percentage is probably what matters the most, uh, if the numerator and denominator in these fractions are both really small, we might, might not be getting valuable information. So 100% conversion rate when there are only two attempts made doesn't really tell us the whole picture. So it's really important to look at these always within the context of the larger organization. And kind of taking a step back, it's always important with any business to measure the impact that you're having. Um, all technology is, is, in essence, meant to help people. And so one of the things that we'll want to measure is the impact on people. Um, and so in our, in our sample delivery site, this could be something like, you know, the number of users that have visitor, visited the site or the number of users that have placed an order through our service. Those are the number of people that we've impacted by um, providing our, our technology. Um, another example of this on our site could be the number of drivers that we're employing and providing a, a livelihood to. Uh, and so it's always important to kind of think about the impact that you're having because the people that you're employing um, and the people that you're impacting is always going to tie back to how successful your company is. Uh, and just some pitfalls to uh, just be aware of when measuring people is to be aware of dummy accounts or null data. Uh, and so. A great example of that is just with, with websites. You might have a user that has had or created multiple accounts, and so you want to be able to keep track of that user across all those accounts and not double count them to make sure you're measuring the right amount of impact that you're having. And another thing to be especially careful with kind of just website traffic is be aware of bots. Those aren't real people. That doesn't measure the impact that you're having. 
Awesome. So uh, the next thing we want to talk about is is totals, um, and this can be done in a lot of different ways. But so far, we've been counting things like the number of orders, number of website visits, and things like that. But each one of those entities, so to speak, whether that's a person or an order, um, they all have numeric information related to themselves. So now we're moving from just the counting of these entities to typically just summing things up, summing up those numeric uh, pieces of information about those entities uh, as, we, uh, as we go forward. Um, here, there's, there's a lot of different uh, things that can go wrong. Uh, we're, we're starting to bring in more than just counting math in here. So the main pitfall here oftentimes comes about with clear definitions. Total might mean something different to different people. We're talking about revenue versus sale price versus order price. So having these different versions of them, oftentimes what we'll see, um, you know, out in the field is that people have, uh, you know, seven people come to a meeting with seven different versions of what revenue means, and they end up discussing more about their definitions and actually using the numbers to make decisions. So having clear definitions about what you're talking about is extremely important. Um, but also, again, removing noise. So one example here would be, you know, total usage of a website or application versus total engaged minutes, right? Um, order, uh, order profits, but not on return items. So having to eliminating things that you don't actually want to count that are actually having that impact on your business um, is also going to be really important. Uh, so we talked about totals, which are essentially just sums or counts. Um, it's also important to take a look at things that vary by user or by order. Um, and so these things that vary um, come in different shapes and sizes. And so common examples of these could just be averages, your medians, your modes. Um, and then some advanced uh, metrics for things that vary could be things like probability and measuring risk, because those are going to vary across different um, users or different different data points. Um, just looking back on our example, some things that we might want to measure that vary um, could be the average price of a meal. And calculating the average price of a meal allows us to put in context what a normal entry or food um, order, uh, how that compares to the actual average. Um, another example here could be the most common satisfaction rating given by a user. If our site has a, um, a, a satisfaction rating of, of four across all of our deliveries and we get a couple of threes, even though that might seem like it's on par when we compare that to the, the mode here, um, it gives us context to kind of ask more questions and figure out why that one particular order was, was below the, uh, the most common satisfaction rating. And the key thing to be aware of when you're talking about things that vary, when you're talking about averages, medians, and modes, is uh, to just be on the lookout for outliers. Um, you might have a few data points that tend to skew the data one direction or the other. Uh, and so just keep that in mind when you're, you're looking at averages. Awesome. So the next thing we want to talk about here is, is quality. And, and this is where you know, we, we start getting into some of the more advanced ways of measuring things. You know, so far what we've been doing is, uh, like I said, mostly review, but we want to get that firm foundation. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of what we talked about, many, many tools have some kind of analytics built in for a lot of these uh, metrics. You know, simple things, conversion rates, bounce rates. Um, however, if you have all the raw data, you can really get into some of the more complex things, talking about quality. Um, it's a much more nuanced concept than what we were talking about before, and there's a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, but ultimately, this type of measuring is what's typically more important to focus on um, for businesses about their uh, uh, customers. This is what's going to really drive success, and, and, and you have to worry more also not just about, you know, what are the successes, but also what are the failures. You know, things like complaints and cold meals that were sent or erroneous orders and things like that. So um, definitely something to, uh, to look out for. Now, we can define successes and failures, uh, typically against some kind of standard of quality. Um, further subdivision of, of success measures. So how good was a successful event uh, attempt? Um, was it great? Just okay? Was it poor? 
Um, how we actually measure this can vary. Either we're collecting this as its own data point in the form of a survey, so it simply just asks people, you know, what did you think about the service? What did you think about our website? What did you think about um, the food that you received? Or we can potentially, and this is where having that raw data and really owning it can, can be powerful, we can try and guess at a lot of this. If, you know, surveys aren't always reliable ways of getting all the information. Um, so trying, guessing at it by looking at a complex stream of event data. It might be as simple as taking a look at the length of time for a delivery, you know, so if it was over an hour long, then hey, that's probably not what we're looking for. We want to get food to people faster than that. Or it can be as complex as noting that it took many more clicks than we expected to actually complete an order. Are people bouncing back and forth between pages? This could be indication that they're confused and that they're not having a good experience with it, especially if we see that some of those people don't end up ordering. Um, and we can even combine these different ways of measuring success and measuring quality to create various quality or risk-related scores. Um, and now we can count how many of the interactions that customers had with us are above or below a certain quality score and kind of use that as a way to track whether we are, um, you know, hitting the targets that we want? Are people having the quality of experience with our product that we expect them to have, that we're striving for them to have? And of course, the pitfalls here are, are, are numerous. Uh, this is where a lot of things can go wrong because we're putting together complex metrics. So making sure that whether it's something like getting the math right or, or you know, for something as, like the types of metrics that I'm talking about, maybe um, the number of clicks is, is expected versus not expected. What do we mean by that? Um, but also misinterpreting the data is, is very common here. When you have surveys and people are rating things as fours and you say, hey, four out of five is good, but oftentimes people would rate things as a five out of five unless they had something really wrong with it. So interpretation as well as getting the calculations uh, are, are hugely important here. So we talked about measuring a standard of quality. Um, it's important to, to look at that, that quality, that quality measure um, compared to the overall uh, count. And so quality ratio, just like conversion ratios are very important. Um, and quality ratios uh, are sometimes a better metric or can be a better metric than just a simple average or a comparison to an average. Um, so a great example of this, kind of tying back to our, our delivery service, um, say we wanted to kind of take a look at all the drivers in our service and, and figure out which ones were, we're doing a great job, which ones we should maybe think about um, for a, a promotion. And so if we were to look at a driver's just average time to deliver, um, that time could be um, could be high because of certain outliers. Averages tend to have outliers. But if we were to instead look at the number of successful deliveries, the percent of uh, quality deliveries that that driver has made, that could give us a different answer. Uh, a driver could have had 99% successful deliveries and maybe one incomplete delivery, um, which would give them a higher quality ratio than maybe, uh, maybe their average. Um, and so it's, it's just important to kind of take a step back and think about whether you're, you're measuring quality or if you're just looking at the average. Um, another, another example of, of this that we use within Looker is uh, just query runtime. We run a certain number of queries, um, and a common metric is how long or how often um, do these queries run, what's kind of the time frame for these queries to return. And so one way to look at this would just be to look at the average query runtime, which could be high, again, because of these outliers. But if we were to look at the percent of quality queries that were returned where quality could mean under two minutes, that percent of quality queries could actually give us a better insight into um, what we're trying to measure there. Yeah, so the, the next thing here is what are we going to be doing with all these metrics? So oftentimes we don't want to just look at overall aggregates like we've been talking about now, but actually slicing these measures by different intrinsic attributes. So this is where we can start really asking about correlation, taking maybe the average order delivery time by location or um, purchase attempt successes, success rate by browser or total revenue by customer age. So 
now is when we can start uh, asking questions about how one metric will ultimately impact another metric. Uh, since this is where decisions will really be made, you know, campaigns to specific user demographics, uh, website improvements by browser, delivery methods by location, uh, it's really critical that we know we're measuring the right things. And again, this is why we've been talking about all the very basic things leading up to this. Uh, so, you know, looking at these types of correlations and, and finding, you know, if, for example, just taking that uh, um, browser-specific one, right? If, if we notice that in one browser people are taking three times as long to get through and make orders or their conversion rate is 10% lower than the average with other browsers, somebody's going to have to do something about that. And, and that means spending time uh, going into updating code about the, the, the for, for the website for a specific browser. And that's resources that are gone. So we want to really make sure that we're getting the right thing that we're measuring. Um, it, it's very easy to get the wrong kind of data out of this and then start, you know, chasing, uh, going on wild goose chases, trying to um, fix something in your website that didn't even need to be fixed or worse, it's actually the best thing instead of the worst thing. Um, so that's why you want to make sure that everything is, is very accurate. Um, so a few pitfalls here is, is getting to appropriate uh, slicing and, and using the proper measures, right? So when I say appropriate slicing, you know, if we look at customers by every single age group being every age group being one year of age older, um, that probably won't tell us anything. We, we probably want to uh, group them together uh, in some kinds of um, uh, sensible grouping, so the teenagers versus the 20-something-year-olds and so on and so forth. Um, and that way we can probably get something more insightful than just saying the difference between 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds where there probably won't be that much of a difference. So this is where using some intuition can oftentimes go a long way. Obviously, you always want to double check that uh, against the data itself. Who knows, maybe there's a big difference between 17 and 18 year olds, then who knows, that could just be because 18 year olds have a credit card or whatever that might be. Um, but using some intuition to at least start off your analysis is always going to go a long way. Uh, we talked about measuring against or slicing and dicing by intrinsic attributes, which usually tend to be data points that are um, that are that we tend to already store. Uh, but when you start to think about deriving dimensions or when you start to just create new calculations, those calculations tend to give you a lot of insight. Even though these, these calculations might not be ready, readily available, um, they, they can give you huge insights to your data. And some common examples of that, which we'll go into more detail, um, are cohorts, lifetime value, um, and sequencing and, and sessionization. If we take cohorting as an example, a cohort is essentially just a, a bucket or a group that um, looks at a set of users as one unit and then breaks them up into related groups for analytics. So if we were to derive a dimension or if we were to derive an attribute, uh, in this case something like days since a user has signed up or days since a user has placed first order, that's just a simple calculation. We're just doing a date difference from a current user's order to when they first signed up or the, the first time that they've placed an order. Uh, by, by doing that, we can bucket all of those users into a group or a cohort and we can do advanced analytics like calculate active users, inactive users, calculate the uh, user's retention over time. Uh, so, at, for example, all users with the same accusation date belong to the same cohort, but at which rate are they dropping off month over month? We can calculate that since we've already come up with uh, a unit that measures days since a user has signed up that's now associated with every order price. Um, and because we now know the rate at which we need to acquire new users, we can identify patterns of, of attrition or users that are leaving the site. Um, and if we are able to calculate a number, say where 10% of users are leaving our, our site every month, we can uh, then better understand the rate at which we need to acquire new users to create the growth rate that we need for our business. So just these small measures, these small uh, calculations that we're making can give us just huge insights. Awesome. Yeah, another uh, common uh, metric to look at is lifetime value. Um, at its simplest, customer lifetime value is just the total revenue realized, the same way that we've done this calculation before, 
but this time split out by each customer. There's a lot that can be done with this metric now that we can think about it as a property or an attribute of the individual customer, not just a total over uh, the entire organization. So combining this with earlier concepts, we can now take the average of the customer lifetime value, so there's variance here, and of course slice this by anything else, by location, by demographic, by info that we're getting off of their web usage. Um, a common use case is to check how much profit is gained from an individual customer. So if we know how much money we've spent on acquiring the business of that customer, whether that's through advertising, targeted marketing, all those other components, we can see whether it's worth it or not to actually acquire them. Um, we can now think of this as its own success term. Is this, is this person profitable or not profitable? Um, sometimes it's as simple as just seeing the expenses that we spent on the items that we sold to them, uh, and then we're just looking at a one-to-one, -one, everything that they ordered, all the profit off the orders. But oftentimes the thing that makes this uh, a little bit more complex is that things like advertising aren't spent on a per-user basis, right? You spend a lot of money on advertising, which goes to a lot of people that don't actually uh, buy anything from, from your store. Some of them do buy things, but some of them buy very little, so they don't make up for that advertising cost. And then some people buy a lot, which makes up for, for all of that. So, Combining this with other metrics is going to be a very, uh, can be a very complicated endeavor, but oftentimes this is the core metric that uh, companies are looking at because they want to know how much they should be spending on getting those customers. Um, one really simple pitfall, but I've seen people fall into this a lot of times, is time. Um, new users will, by almost by definition, have a lower lifetime value. So we want to make sure we're doing an apples to apples comparison when we're talking about lifetime value of customers, um, not comparing the new ones to the old ones who have had more time to uh, purchase more from your store um, with the new ones who've just made their first purchase yesterday. Um, another example of a, a derived dimension is just sequencing. So if we were to go through and order uh, a user's orders from one to N, um, or if we were to go through and, and order a user's events on our site from 1 to N, we can do um, advanced analytics. We can calculate how the attributes of the first orders um, or deliveries compare to the last set of orders or deliveries. So, for example, has a driver, um, as a driver has, has had more orders and has had more deliveries on our site, um, has their time to deliver uh, changed from the, the first set of orders to their last set of orders? Um, and, and this ordering can also be used to define a session. So when we are able to sessionize a, a user's events on a website or even their orders, um, we can determine where the user drop-off occurs. So what events um, does a user go through before either a success criteria or a failure criteria? What events, um, what's the typical event flow before uh, a user places an order or schedules a delivery? Awesome. So that was a lot that we went through, and hopefully you guys all learned uh, quite a bit here, um, even if you did know uh, a decent amount about this, these topics already. Um, hopefully you added something new that you hadn't thought of before. Um, and we just want to go over kind of what, what to take away from this. What, what is it that uh, you can do with this new information if you guys are working as data analysts or business analysts, uh, wherever it is that you guys are. Um, and just a couple of things that I, I, I wanted to recommend, uh, starting with um, just beginning small and, and working your way up. There's a reason why we went in the order that we did uh, for this presentation, starting with really simple things. It might be very tempting to go straight for the complex metrics and start you know, analyzing customer lifetime value and slicing it this way and that way, and even you know, when it comes to advanced analytics and bringing in statistics and, and all of this. But, Remember, if it's done incorrectly at the base level, you're going to be, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So you want to make sure that you're you're starting with those basics, getting a firm foundation, using those already. You'll be surprised how much you can get out of it. And then as you build on top of that, get that complexity as you need it. As people start really exhausting the possibilities with the basics, then go up to something more complex. 
Um, especially if, you know, the people that you're working with are much, much less technical than you are and you're leading this kind of foray into the data space, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping everybody with you and as they get more and more comfortable with the basic metrics, then slowly introduce to them the more complex things so that they can work with that. So with that said, we have a few uh, recommendations for how you can really get this socialized uh, within your organization. Um, one idea is to try out some kind of monthly data enablement meeting, right? So um, maybe your first meeting would cover the 10 ways to measure or something like that. So allow uh, some time for you to get in touch with the business users at your organization who are making decisions off of this data or looking at reports that, that have these metrics in them and explain exactly what's going on. Explain potentially some nuances and the differences of doing analysis one way versus the other, measuring one thing versus, the, versus another, and, and you know, explaining how that might impact their decision. Another idea is, you know, along the same concept, but holds uh, a weekly office hours where the people that are consuming this data, consuming this information, can come in and ask you questions about, you know, hey, I've done my reports this way and I've also used that. When should I be using average versus median? Um, when should I be using rates versus just the averages? All of those types of questions and, and, and give them kind of that forum to, to be able to ask those, uh, those things of somebody that's more knowledgeable than them about the data itself. Um, and it may be at its simplest, this could also mean a chat channel for anybody that's using something like Slack or any other type of um, you know, uh, messaging system inside your organization. Open a Slack channel for, for questions on reports or definitions of metrics or any, anything around the data so that people can have a, a really easy way to ask a question to you every now and then and you know, not necessarily in, in as public a way you can get them that message. And also this is a great way to collect information about where are people confused and that can maybe inform your monthly data enablement meetings. So that, you know, if one person asks a question, chances are there's five to ten other people that had that question and just never got around to asking it. Um, so there's a lot of different ways and, you know, you, I'm sure you guys can brainstorm additional ways to get this information um, out to those who need it. Um, so all these uh, ways to measure, um, you might have a good idea about the pitfalls and, and different ways to measure, kind of 101 class that we just uh, did. Um, but again, getting that socialized within your team and not just keeping that inside of the, the smaller, you know, data savvy uh, people um, at your organization is that that's really what's going to be able to get everybody uh, to drive the business forward. And as you revisit some of the things that we talked about, try to think about metrics on which you can take action. Um, a, a common pitfall, a common thing that we see across organizations is that organizations will tend to focus on what we call vanity metrics. And so they'll, they'll you know, have their accounts, they'll measure their attempts and their successes, but they stop with those operational use cases and don't take that, that step further into some of these more advanced um, analytics and the, the advanced ways to measure like quality ratios and quality and measuring you know, cohort analysis and retention analysis. So, so go back to your data, um, see if there are any ways you can expand the analysis that you have, see if you're avoiding some of the common pitfalls that we talked about, um, and, and try and think of ways that you can take action on, on the things that you are keeping track of and the things that you are measuring. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, uh, for listening in. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions right now. I see we're, we're getting some coming in. Um, and uh, the first one we have right here is our contact information. So, yeah, uh, you guys can email us if you have any questions after this that pop up. Our email addresses are really simple, and we'll leave this uh, slide up because it's just our first name at looker.com. So I'm Marcel at looker.com, and Harthi is Harthi at looker.com. Excellent. Thank you so much, Harthi and Marcel. This is Michael Steinhardt once again reminding everybody in the audience that there's still time to send in your questions using the Q&A feature on your console. If for some reason you're watching this after we're done, if you're watching this on demand, you can still send in your questions and we'll respond to them via email. Uh, and if for some reason we don't get to your question during the allotted time, we'll also 
make sure to respond via email. So thank you once again for that. And uh, we'll dip right back into the queue for a couple of other questions. Uh, first one, what is the biggest challenge that customers face when they're trying to do good BI? I mean, you mentioned uh, biting off too much at the beginning or you know, isolating the right data. But, but can you just go into a little bit more detail on uh, the biggest challenges and how to surmount them? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I think, um, and, and the reason why we structured this in this kind of building block fashion, um, you know, that, that is oftentimes what it comes down to. So biting off more that you can, than you can chew, um, because organizations ultimately do want to look at complex metrics, and we understand that that's important. But not having a good way to kind of trace that back to what does this metric fundamentally mean? So when, you know, something is as high level as, you know, what percent of our customers had a good quality interaction with us. Well, that could mean a million things. So being able to go back and trace back the definition of what does it mean to be good quality? How are we counting that? Are we looking at ratios here? Going all the way back to the fundamental uh, details. If you don't have that stored as some kind of set of definitions um, for, for uh, people to look back at and be able to find out what these metrics mean, um, as, a, as a quick little uh, side note about this, um, when it comes to uh, Looker itself, Looker as, as a piece of software um, has the ability to make exactly the definitions around all of these metrics in such a building block fashion. You actually build them out in these components, build on top of that, creating more and more complexity. So you always have this kind of paper trail for knowing how things are defined. And uh, you know whether it's Looker or not, um, having that kind of paper trail is is essential to making sure that you're actually getting the right information uh, uh, to start making those decisions. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and one other question that's kind of related, um, but what are some of the biggest mistakes that you've seen people make when attempting to apply BI to their businesses? Yeah, um, so Marcel just talked a little bit about kind of the paper trail. So make sure you're you're defining your metrics clearly, and you know share that that paper trail with the rest of the organization. Um, we find that sometimes analysts in different groups within an organization will tend to come to their own conclusion about the definition of a metric, and so it's important to internal internalize within a team and, and share. Um, share data and share the thought process behind how you're defining these metrics across the organization. And with a tool like Looker, where it's so easy and clear to see the definition behind a metric and, and how something is defined, um, it, it really helps eliminate some of those pitfalls where you have data chaos within your organization. All right, thanks. Um, one uh, one individual popped up. Uh, it sound as though, sounds as though Looker is a company and a tool. Um, can you just give us a little bit more background on Looker and what it is? Yeah, for sure. So uh, Looker is both a, a company and a tool. That is exactly correct. So um, at Looker, we've created a piece of, piece of software that is called Looker. And essentially what this is is a uh, business analytics or data platform that organizations can use to really um, make it easy for everybody in an organization to be able to ask the questions of the data that they need um, uh, to, uh, to, to drive their organization. Um, at a real high level, what this allows is for um, the real data savvy uh, people, the data analysts, so to speak, to be able to create this model within the uh, software itself where they create these definitions and put in the logic behind how all these calculations are made, and then non-technical business users can come in and just do a drag and drop interface, ask the questions that they want, while Looker in the background will assemble complex uh, SQL queries um, to be able to answer those questions. So it really divides up uh, the labor there between the, the technical users building the model and then the potentially dozens of times uh, more users on the front end to just consume that information and ask the questions as they need. Cool. Thank you. And uh, if audience members want to learn more, I know that I've mentioned that we've got the related resources that are listed under the uh, 
on the right hand side of the console where you can learn more about Looker. You can get some more information about the analytics that are available to you, and you can also download today's slides if you want to refer to them, take some notes, pass them along to a friend. Uh, but are there any other quick links you might want to offer for, for audience members to learn more? Yeah, um, our, our website at looker.com is actually a great resource for different types of analysis that um, you might want to do for, for different verticals and in different marketplaces. So I would browse through our website. You can also sign up for a trial of our, our product, um, and you'll be matched with both a, a sales engineer and um, someone in our product team who will be able to walk you through um, kind of how our product works and how you can start applying some of the common metrics that might be relevant for your business um, today. Great. Thank you so much. And as I mentioned, um, take a look, everybody in the audience, at the right-hand side of your console. You can find some related resources that uh, discuss in greater detail what Harthi just outlined for us just now. And uh, underneath the Q&A box, you'll find some blogs uh, with some timely insights into BI and analytics right now. And with that, it looks as though we are hitting the end of our allotted time. I hope that everybody enjoyed today's webcast presentation. And if you would like to refer a friend, it will be available for viewing on demand within 48 hours from now. And if you're watching this on demand, as I mentioned, you can send in your questions at any point, and we'll definitely respond via email. Uh, if you'd like to download today's presentation. Also, those slides are available in the Related Resources section. And with that, I'm going to thank our sponsor, Looker. And again, I want to thank Harthi Sadasivam and Marcel Babai, Marcel Babai for joining us today. And my name is Michael Steinhardt for CBS Interactive, and I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.